Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought all, out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my father. The Jews who heard these words were again divided. Many of them said, He is demon-possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, These are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Then came the festival of dedication in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were, gathered, who were there gathered around him, saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did, not tell, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father and are one. Again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these things, for which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I have said you are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be set aside, what about the one whom the Father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy, because I said I am God's Son? Do not believe me unless I do the works of my Father. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I in the Father. Again, they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. Then Jesus went back across.
across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. Then he stayed, there he stayed, and many people came to him. They said, though John never performed a sign, all that John said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. God, my mouth, I speak the message that I prepared, that it be his message, not my message. And his will might be done, not mine. That he might receive glory and honor, not honor. And all those with ears might hear the words of the Lord. Amen. Amen. My sermon this morning is entitled, How Do We Respond to God? See, that's the question that this scripture should cause us to, to consider because God shows up in all sorts of different places. Throughout history, God has been showing up, you know, whether it's the burning bush or uh, the, the fire coming down and consuming the stones or in a little manger in a cave. But how do the people react? 
He's talking in this group to these Pharisees, the, with, like the, it's, it's out of that man born blind passage. And these are religious leaders who have it all figured out. You know, they're the type of people who you uh, name uh, a scripture and, and they know exactly where it comes from. I've, I've told you sometimes Mandy and I will play that game where uh, she'll start reading uh, the Bible, but uh, usually, you know, into the evening when my mental capacity is down. Uh, and uh, she'll, uh, she'll start reading a scripture and I have to tell her where it comes from. Usually I can, I can tell her, uh, you know, the book. Sometimes I can do the, the number, but you know me in numbers, so no, I don't always remember that. But there are stories about the Pharisees that you could take a, a, a book and poke a pin through, a, a, through it and tell them what, page, what word it went through on, on what page and they could tell you the, the word that it went through on the next page. These are guys whose, whose memories are impressive. They know everything. And yet, You know, you and I, sometimes we, we have that reaction. We've got it all figured out, and then God shows up someplace. Something challenges that idea. We, we encounter someone, and we, we, we feel the Holy Spirit working on us, and, and we feel a prompting. And all of a sudden, we're, we're not quite as comfortable with everything. And we want to go back to that sort of nice, neat little box that we've got God in. We want to go back to the comfortable ways. We want to go back to our seniority where we, we, we have our, our position and it's protected and we don't have to worry about it at all. And then reality puts us in the face. I love that he goes through this whole, whole deal. He, he has the whole story about being the shepherd and the sheep pen is describing this uh, uh, in the ancient world. This would be, uh, if you ever drive uh, through a, a back town or you know, an old, old town or something and see the, 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 town, the, the town pound, right? You know, it's this little stone wall with a gate, you know, so that if uh, your cow or sheep or whatever was, uh, you know, chickens, probably not chickens. Uh, but, uh, you know, whatever was walking around the, the town, they'd go and put it in the town pound, and then you had to go get it. Right? You ever see those? No, that, that's the sort of sheep pen that you have in the angel. Not, not, uh, not fence posts with a bailing wire or, you know, like, no. no. It's, it's a little stone wall with a gate. I love that he goes through this whole little description. If you see somebody climbing over the wall, you know they don't really belong there. You know, I, 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 I often thought that you could break into cars. If you wanted to become a car thief, you could break into cars by standing next to the car that you wanted to get into and calling AAA. Yeah, no, thank you. No, obviously, I have the same sense of humor. Yeah. Jesus says, no, no, if you see the guy crawling over, he doesn't belong there. It's the guy who goes in by the gate. That's the one who's the owner. If he's got the key that fits the, the lock. If he doesn't mind, it matter who sees him doing it. He says everybody else are thieves. They're out just for the, the quick buck. They're out, they're going to kill the sheep. They're not going to wait. You know, you get two things out of sheep, right? You get wool and you get meat. One of those requires a much more significant investment in time and food. What the other one, you get right away. This is one of these has patience, one of these doesn't. One of these is invested in the care of the flock. You know, if you're just uh, you know, going out, nobody spends money on vet bills for deer. Right? You just go out and shoot them. Get the meat. Call it a day. Not me. Some you say. But some people go out. Diane, you go out. You, know, you get the meat, but no vet bills. On your cows, vet bills. Yes. The guy crawling over the, the thing doesn't care about it. People who are only interested in, in what you can, you know, how they can use you don't care. Jesus says, I give my sheep eternal life. You know, the nice thing about pigs is that they're a six-month investment of time. 
chickens a little bit longer, you know, you know, the, you know dog a little bit longer. But, but you know, the, he says, I give my sheep eternal life. Some people get it, some people go, oh yeah, no, this is good. And other folks say, no, no, this, this upsets the apple cart. This, this is confusing to me. This doesn't fit with my understanding. Probably it's those folks who would climb home to the wall. Those folks who are only interested in what they can get out of the sheep. Which one are we more like? Are we the ones who have to be right? All the time, you ever know somebody like that? Maybe you are somebody like that. I mean, I correct grammar in books. I had an encyclopedia salesman, uh, you know, come one day, you know, I was trying to sell kid encyclopedias to us. Uh, and, you know, I'm always happy to talk to a real person on the phone in person. And, uh, and he's, he's uh, you know, showing me the stuff. He goes, now, what would you do if your kids asked you why uh, fl uh, flamingos were pink? And I said, well, because they trip. And it's the coloring for the shrimp. But he goes, well, that's 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 right. And he opened the page, and you know, there it said it. And uh, I said, well, it actually, you got it's because they eat shrimps, and that's not right. The plural of shrimp is shrimp. Obviously, he didn't make the sale. <laughs> the Pharisees are like that. They know everything. They're always right. And now Jesus is rewriting the book on them. Almost literally. They have a challenge. Some of them, they see God working in Jesus and go, okay, I don't quite get it, but I'm, I'm on the fall of this. Others, they go, no, no, this is, this is too new for me. I'm not doing it. And then it says he goes to Solomon's Colonnade, the festival of dedication. Your little footnote should have in your Bible that dedication is Hanukkah. Hanukkah means dedication. Uh, so, you know, this is always one of the things I always love to point out. Hanukkah is a biblical holiday. Uh, I told me that I have more Hanukkah ties than I do Christmas ties. It may be because there are more uh, tasteful Hanukkah ties out there than tasteful Christmas ties, because I'm not going to do, you know, I, I do a one I get to play music. Uh, yeah, that yeah, uh, yeah, used to uh, play music. Uh, Jesus goes to, to Jerusalem to, to, to remember Hanukkah. The, the celebration, let's see, at this point is about 125, 150 years before when the, the Jews managed to kick the Slukids, the, the, the folks uh, who inherited uh, Algernon the Great's kingdom. Uh, that was Israel, uh, kicks the Seleucids out, and they, they go and they take over, they have this military victory. I was thinking about it uh, this, this past week. How many times the story in, in ancient history and modern history has been, there was this massive, almighty, powerful army all set to destroy the Jews, whether it was in 1973 or 1964, or the Warsaw Ghetto, or, you know, a mighty powerful army all set to destroy the Jews, and this little tiny renegade band of uh, you know, people who shouldn't win, win. That's, that's the story of Hanukkah in a nutshell. I, I always love Hanukkah because it, in, in Cavendish, at least, Hanukkah is the time of the year when the Baptist minister comes into the elementary school and explains the role to classes. I think I'm talking to the entire school this year, not just the, the grades my kids are in various times. It's a military victory that's fresh in their minds. Remember how many of the disciples are named after Maccabean heroes. There are two who are named after Judah Maccabee. And when Judas Iscariot commits suicide, he's replaced by a guy named Matthias, which is Judah Maccabee's brother's name. It's a popular uh, thing in everybody's head. You know, think about how many babies just after the Revolutionary War uh, in the United States, how many babies were named George? for George Washington, not uh, King George. He goes to celebrate Hanukkah in Jerusalem, and instead of being the Slukids, they got rid of the Slukids, but a few years after that, these funny Italian Romans 
show up. And they're speaking Greek and Latin. And they're a mighty military power with elephants and everything. And they take over and they set up the, uh, the, the eagle, the, the symbol of the military might at the temple. They put one of those idols that can't speak or walk or talk in the temple. And all the Jews' minds go back to, hey, we did it about, about just, just a little while ago. We managed to get rid of some people who were setting up idols. And so Jesus goes to the temple and they are excited. They know how this story is supposed to go. They've read all the Maccabean books. They've got the, you know, they they've got all the, the, the videos at home. They they watched the, the alternative histories as to what would happen if, if, if this was the victory again. They're excited. They've been carrying concealed weapons for all these years, ready for the moment when God's Messiah would show up and they could all pounce. Literally, that's what the scary dagger men, Sakari, means. Carrying a little dagger around, waiting for the time to strike a, strike a victory for God. Remember uh, the discussion about the uh, Jesus says, if you don't have a cloak, let's go and sell it. If you don't have a sword, go and sell your cloak and buy one. And the disciples, oh, we have two! And Jesus is arrested, and Peter slices him off in the Same sort of people. Jesus is in the temple. Okay, we know how this is supposed to go. From other scriptures, we know he goes into the temple. So look, he's not afraid to, uh, you know, uh, kick tuchets and take names. He does it with the money changers. You can just imagine some people going, yeah, good, this is good. Let's get rid of these Romans. Are you going to announce now your, your candidacy for Messiah? No, not quite that. Are you going to announce now that you're the Messiah of God, the, the chosen one, the anointed, the smeared? That's what Christos, right? Anointed, Messiah, smeared, covered with oil, uh, identified as God's chosen one. Is this the time? You can just imagine people with bumper stickers ready to pull them out. Right? You know, I'm ready for Jesus. It was done. If, if you understood what I was doing, if you were my sheep, you would hear my commands. And all these people who are looking for a military messiah, I mean, they're hyped up. So what do they do? They pick up rocks and get ready to stone him. Again, this is a pattern that we've seen at other times. When Antiochus Epiphanes, the Seleucid, uh, announces that he's God at, uh, at the festival of, of, uh, of Sukkot, when everybody's got an etrog, a citron, a, a little lemony type fruit in their hand, he, he stands up, Antiochus Epiphanes, he, he, like Epiphany, you know, God showing up at Christmas time. He, he said, I'm God, and everybody takes the little lemony thing and chucks it at him. Well, this time it's a little bit different. Jesus says, no, no, I'm not going to say I'm Messiah. And everybody's angry, so they pick up a rock and they're ready to chuck it at him. Because they had not been locked as yet. <laughs> people who are looking for a military victory are violent people. They've got that in them. You see, they want Jesus to be the way that, that, that they are. They, they want him to, to you know, The people want Jesus to look like them. They're only interested if he's, if he's going to do the things that they, they want. And we have to ask ourselves, is that how we are? Are we only interested in a Jesus that reflects our image, that reflects our attitudes? You know, it's always interesting what pictures people have of Jesus, right? If you're a white family, you have a white Jesus. If you're a black family, you have a black Jesus. If you're you know, an Asian family, you have an Asian Jesus. You know, whatever, you know, whatever culture you have, the, the Jesus sort of looks like. Is that what we want? We want Jesus to look like us? What we should want is us to look like Jesus. We're supposed to reflect 
His image, not the other way around. That's why we sing at the Christmas time part, the Herald Angels sing, right? Adam's likeness now he face, stamp thine image in its place. We're supposed to, to, to get rid of our desires. We're supposed to get rid of what, what we think is important and say, no, no, what you want is important. See, those people there who pick up those stones to throw them at Jesus, they've got their own desires. They've got their own agendas. I love Jesus' comment in, in verse 33. He says, what are you stoning me for? Is it because of all the good things that I've done? And they say, no, no, it's because you blasphemed. It's the blasphemy that you're speaking. You're saying that you are the Son of God. Again, if anybody ever thinks that, that you know, Jesus doesn't make those statements, well, then why do they get so upset at it? They certainly heard him say things. You see, when you read the Bible, a, a fairly cursory reading of it shows that God is up here and everything else is down here. There's a, a divide between the created and the creator. And so to say, oh no, God and humanity are equal in, in ancient Judaism, in modern Judaism, in, in, uh, in, in Islam, you know, why do they get so you know, upset about images of, uh, of the prophet? No, you know, it's a similar deal. No, no, that's blasphemy. You can't, you can't, can't do that. You're not supposed to make uh, graven images. You're not supposed to have stuff on earth that represents God. That's the rule. I think it's in the Ten Commandments. See, the amazing thing about the message of the Hebrew Bible is that instead of the way that everything else works, all the other religions make their gods, you know, make God, you know, an image of it out of something on this earth. Bunch of legs, or it looks like an elephant, or it looks like a bull, or a golden calf, or it looks like stuff I won't mention. All other religions say, no, no, this it, thing that we've made is like God. And the, the amazing thing about the, the biblical message is God says, no, no, I'm making you in my image, not the other way around. Male and female. And so then Jesus shows up, is born in that manger, and it, it fulfills that, that truth because not only does God make all of humanity in his image, God himself becomes human, becomes incarnate, has a human existence like you and me and every person who's ever lived before and after Jesus. As a final ta-da on that statement that God makes us in His image, He actually becomes one of us. And it's a thing. A real thing. Not the throne. So then there's this question that you and I have to ask ourselves because God shows up he shows up to those people. He shows up to you and me in this story. As we read it and think about it. When we meditate on the fact that, that 2,000 years ago in a little cave. Maybe not on December 25th. But, but in a little cave in, in, in Judea. A manger.
like some of the people in this story, do we try to destroy Jesus? Do we say, no, no, I'm, I'm, when, when you show up in, in my life, I'm, I'm going to get rid of you. That doesn't conform to, to what I want. That doesn't conform to my understanding. We're Yankees, so we don't destroy anything. We just ignore it, right? Yankees don't tear down barns. We know that they'll fall down eventually on their own. We don't have to destroy Jesus. We'll, we'll just ignore him until it goes away. Is that how we are? Or are we like the people who go and say, yeah, I don't quite know how this all fits. I don't quite know how this all works. But I can see that God is moving in this man. I can see the works that he has done in my life and other people's lives. And yes, I believe that God is showing His great love for us by coming and being with us. He came in Bethlehem and He's come to Cavendish today. Will we live our lives in reaction to that hope?